Welcome everybody to this uh, wider session on uh, sovereign debt. And uh, we have a, an excellent um, team of uh, speakers today. Um, our panel is going to uh, consist of um, Mahmoud uh, Mihildin. Mahmoud is the um, UN Special Envoy on financing the 2030 agenda. And uh, he's an IMF executive director for the Arab countries. Among his past uh, appointments were Egypt's Minister of Investment uh, and World Bank uh, Senior Vice President, as well as being a professor at Cairo University. Uh, and then we will be having um, uh, Maureen Ware as our um, second speaker. She's a, a senior economist in the research department of the Central Bank of uh, Kenya, formerly with uh, WIDA, uh, working closely with the Wangozi Institute in Tanzania. And she was previously with the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis. Mm -hmm. And then our third um, speaker will be uh, David Mahali, who is Senior Economic Anal Analyst at the Natural Resources Growth Institute. And he is also currently a researcher at the University of Kiel's economics department. David works particularly on issues of um, international debt and uh, natural resources. Um, I am Tony Addison, a professor of uh, development economics, University of Copenhagen, and a non-resident senior research fellow of uh, UNU WIDA. Um, the session will proceed with all of our speakers speaking, and then we will have, if we have any time left, um, a Q&A. But the Q&A will be simply you put your questions into the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and if there is time, then we can try and um, have the speakers answer the questions. So I'm going to begin with um, Mahmoud. We're going to show a short uh, video from uh, Mahmoud of his presentation, and then he's going to come in for a couple of additional points, and then we're going to proceed to Maureen and then to David. Okay, so thank you for your patience uh, with all the technology this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Tony and uh, Wider, for uh, the kind uh, invitation to uh, uh, share with you some thoughts on one of the most uh, critical challenges facing our world today, including, of course, the developing economies and emerging markets. Uh, that is debt and sovereign debt and how to manage it uh, better to avoid um, a debt crisis. Uh, before I talk about uh, debt uh, specifically, I just like to mention that for many years, the world had been seeing um, um, a good era of um, uh, great moderation and conversions. Uh, by great moderation, it is meant, uh, um, uh, by great, uh, repeat this, uh, uh, by great mo moderation, um, we mean um, um, uh, a period of economic stability, low inflation, and um, uh, inclusive uh, growth. Unfortunately, uh, that period that started from the 1980s ended uh, by the global financial crisis in 2007. But um, the, um, the convergence uh, between developing economies and the advanced economies continued until the, the shock that we're facing all today because of COVID. Um, so now the, um, uh, we are facing a period of uh, great divergence. And we hope to be a very short uh, period and resume um, uh, convergence again, um, um, because if we are going to be seeing a discrepancy of, uh, of income and growth between advanced economies and developing economies and emerging markets, this can create a variety of uh, tensions, um, a vicious cycle in terms of 
poverty, hunger, inequality, and um, human fragility. And this could result in um, enforced um, um, migration as well. Um, so if, um, if I talk about uh, uh, that, then um, uh, as shown in the next slide, that's been put in a context um, um, with the increase of the number of cases um, uh, affected by COVID. I think the, uh, uh, the, the figures um, available uh, today show us around uh, 218 million uh, uh, cases of COVID. Uh, we know from some um, updates from the World Bank and other uh, institutions that uh, this uh, crisis and the implications of the health crisis on economic activities uh, and the lives and livelihoods have a uh, social a socioeconomic impact, including the increase of uh, the number of those who are suffering from extreme poverty, an increase uh, by roughly 120 million um, uh, people uh, suffering uh, from extreme poverty, and eight out of 10 of the world's new uh, poor are located in middle income uh, countries. It is not just income poverty, um, there are um, uh, challenges facing us when it comes to uh, education uh, or learning poverty. It is estimated that an additional 101 million children and youth from grades one to eight fell from the minimum uh, reading uh, proficiency uh, 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 level due to COVID-19 in 2020. Um, this may have wiped out the education gains achieved over the last uh, 20 um, uh, years. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, based on figures we got from um, um, the World Food uh, Program that uh, the number of those suffering from acute hunger had doubled to 265 uh, million uh, people um, around the world, but uh, mainly in, in low income and uh, fragile and post-conflict uh, countries. As it is shown in this slide, um, every major macroeconomic indicator had uh, seen major um, deterioration in the year 2020. Um, uh, drops in employment, um, uh, either you get the figures from the ILO or the IMF, um, you can really see uh, a huge um, uh, increase in uh, unemployment and, uh, and, and job losses. Um, in advanced economies, in developing economies, and emerging markets. Um, some countries, of course, had the capacity to deal with the challenges through uh, social protection schemes, but that was not available in the low-income and middle-income countries. Um, we saw the deterioration of uh, trade. Uh, indeed, trade performed better than uh, what was expected, but still it dropped by more than 5% last year with a major drop in FDI um, um, or the private sector um, investments um, across borders um, uh, uh, last year as well, without really showing signs of recovery uh, for this year. Uh, trade may have shown some signs of recovery, but FDI isn't really showing that there. And again, on the issue of growth, yes, this year is much better than last year that saw a drop of economic activities by 3.2%. Growth this year is going to be uh, um, a positive 6%, but as I said earlier, it's going to be very much uh, uh, reflecting divergence because mm. of the uh, unevenness in the growth path uh, between different countries. In the next slide then, let's get into the business of um, uh, sharing what's happening in the, in the debt uh, uh, front. And um, actually before, we cannot blame it all on uh, COVID-19 because even before COVID, um, by the beginning of the year 2020, uh, there were lots of discussions about uh, the fourth wave of accumulation 
of, um, of debt in advanced economies and in developing economies and emerging markets. Uh, um, increase of debts by governments, by the business sector, um, uh, even by the household uh, uh, sector. And we know from history that the, uh, the three previous waves um, of accumulation of debt um, each and every one of them ended, unfortunately, with a crisis. We saw that after the Latin American um, uh, uh, debt accumulation ended with a crisis. Same happened with Asian crisis. And of course, the global uh, financial um, uh, crisis of 2007, 2008. But we hope that the debt accumulation that we're seeing currently is going to be ending um, uh, differently by not having a crisis. Yes, there is debt accumulation, but so far we haven't seen the, uh, a crisis as such. We are trying to prevent a crisis um, from happening. Um, I'm talking globally. Of course, some individual uh, countries are suffering from debt dis distress and suffering from um, uh, debt, uh, debt crisis, but it's not global um, and stop um, uh, even within groups of countries still so far. Um, within particular countries that we can really help them dealing with the crisis and help ourselves um, not to see uh, a widespread uh, death crisis. And, um, and, and, and from the lessons of history, we saw that uh, crises triggered by shocks uh, resulted in the increasing of uh, investor uh, risk aversion, um, um, risk, uh, higher risk premium, um, higher risk uh, borrowing costs, um, uh, sudden stops of capital inflows, or um, uh, uh, exposure to deep uh, recession. Um, the difference between the waves are basically uh, difference in the financial instruments that were responsible, were involved in the debt um, uh, difficulty, and then the debt crisis. Um, then we are seeing a growing uh, share of the private sector and severity of damage. Um, and then the issue that I like to emphasize, um, that build up supported unsustainable uh, policy, like um, uh, import substitution strategies, um, undiversified economies, um, uh, insufficient sector that didn't raise export earning or uh, had poor corporate um, uh, uh, governance. So what we're trying really to see um, in the efforts uh, today, as, we'll be, uh, 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 as I'll be showing you in the next uh, slide and the slide after. Um, yes, th this slide again is confirming this kind of huge uh, accumulation um, of debt during the last uh, uh, three, uh, four years, including the, the year before uh, COVID. Um, and um, to reach today um, uh, that around 289 trillion or uh, more than 365% of the global um, um, uh, GDP. Um, and in terms of the um, on debt service um, as a share of, uh, of revenue, um, uh, you can see that in the uh, median of selected uh, countries, uh, developed, developing, least developed and small island uh, developing states, you can really see that uh, the countries that are suffering the most from debt service challenges are small island developing uh, states who were exposed um, uh, more than others because of their, the, uh, many of them dependence on, uh, uh, on tourism, the services sector, and um, um, heavy concentration on one or two uh, commodities um, uh, as exports. Um, and then of course, you, we see the challenges in the rest of the developing uh, countries. Advanced economies manage today um, uh, with their fiscal space with very low interest rates to, uh, to finance their debt uh, obligations easier than the developing um, economies. Although that may be uh, seeing some sort of a, uh, of a phasing out, um, uh, with the end of the quantitative easing, as we have been following the recent um, debates during uh, Jackson Hole. Um, but the impact um, is going to be felt more on the developing economies um, uh, because uh, they will be exposed to, uh, to the following. Now we see the 
um, um, a higher uh, borrowing costs. There is the uh, issue of uh, inflation um, and uh, whether the debate um, in advanced economies, is it a transitory kind of, uh, of inflation or not? The case of many developing economies, they feel that uh, right away and it's going to be uh, uh, beyond transitory, it's going to be uh, staying uh, there because of um, uh, the impact of uh, imported uh, goods and, uh, and material, in addition to some structural issues um, as well. Um, so we get that kind of a story then, a slower growth in many of these developing uh, economies, exposure to, um, uh, to higher borrowing costs and impact of inflation, um, in addition uh, to, um, um, to the possibility of shifts in the capital flows towards mm -hmm. the advanced uh, economies, in addition to the fact that you will be seeing uh, some uh, shifts in capital uh, flows because of the increases in interest rates in advanced um, economies. And that will have implications as well on exchange rates. So developing economies and emerging markets um, uh, are in need today to be on alert and take the uh, necessary measures uh, to contain the implications of uh, these uh, dynamics. In the next slide, um, I'm, I was trying to say here that uh, developing economies alone cannot really fix the problem. So this needs some international cooperation. We saw the uh, UN initiative on financing development in the year of COVID-19 and beyond uh, the initiative led by the Secretary General and the uh, prime ministers of uh, Canada and Jamaica, um, and uh, an important initiative covering different aspects related to uh, uh, debt management, to debt vulnerability issues, matters related to um, uh, debt liquidity, and uh, 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 matters related to liquidity, matter, not debt liquidity, matters related to liquidity, in addition to uh, some uh, measures to uh, improve uh, response and, uh, and recovery. Um, um, on, on building back better um, or building forward better, uh, including emphasis on investments for inclusive growth and sustainability and dealing with the leakage as well in the global financial system by preventing illicit financial uh, flows. This is basically the quick summary of, of the initiative of the Secretary General and, um, and the uh, and Canada and Jamaica. And um, uh, many of the recommendations have been um, uh, put into consideration. And uh, we have seen as well uh, some uh, um, uh, good work or initiatives by the G20, um, uh, including the DSSI, which is corresponding to the um, debt service moratorium or debt service suspension initiative by the Secretary General of the UN. Unfortunately, the DSSI, as we all know, is going to have an end in December 2021, and we need to think how to do, to help these developing economies in, um, in in the time that we are seeing these kind of challenges uh, facing them. Uh, the IMF is doing as well some good work through the catastrophe containment and relief trust fund, uh, including uh, availing grants for debt relief for 28 countries. Uh, I, I think uh, they got something like 238 uh, million dollars. Um, um, there was as well this uh, historic uh, uh, milestone of uh, the release of um, um, uh, the general SDR allocation of $650 million. Um, uh, dollars. But as you can see from the next slide here, that um, the SDRs in terms of their allocation, because they are quota based, uh, each country uh, get 95% of its quota. So you end up seeing some uh, uh, countries getting uh, much more than, uh, than the continent of, uh, of Africa, um, uh, for, for instance. Of course, as we know, advanced economies are um, getting the, uh, the bigger share here. And I just got some examples here from um, uh, US and the, the rest of the G7, um, um, and you add to them China, uh, you can really see uh, uh, the average there in these countries um, 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 is much bigger than what the whole continent of Africa is getting about 
$8 billion, while Japan is getting $41 billion. Uh, uh, this gives um, a, a good room for um, rechanneling the SDRs for all of these countries, the advanced economies that are not going to be uh, making use of their um, SDRs, they can reallocate them or rechannel them uh, for the benefit of developing economies and emerging markets. And uh, of course, there is the uh, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust Fund of the IMF that could really um, um, uh, get uh, many countries help and support. But of course, countries need to be with a program to benefit from that uh, with the IMF. Um, and there is a capacity uh, for uh, such fund uh, um, um, uh, as well. Uh, that's why there is some thinking uh, today at the IMF to create a new fund, uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust Fund, that could really be helpful and supportive for countries in the response and recovery with emphasis on uh, greening the recovery, on, on, uh, on making the recovery inclusive, and uh, to deal uh, with the immediate needs uh, for uh, uh, vaccination. Um, so as we can see, really, if we can summarize all of these um, initiatives and um, uh, that they are necessary, but not sufficient. And as mentioned by the uh, managing director of the IMF, even the, uh, the unprecedented issuance of the SDR, you can consider it um, uh, very important, but not a panacea. And um, again, on this slide that in front of you, um, if you if we are putting matters again in the context of achieving the SDGs, and uh, um, before the crisis, we were facing uh, a gap of two point five trillion dollar a year to fund the uh, the SDGs uh, and to make sure that countries can achieve them by twenty thirty. Uh, investments in education and health and infrastructure, which takes the bulk of um, of the investments. Um, uh, required for uh, uh, sustainability, in addition to huge requirements for climate change. Um, you add to that one trillion because of um, the addition needs because of COVID and uh, another 700 billion, which was a drop in, in private sector uh, finance to developing economies. So now we ended with such a huge gap, 4.2 trillion, in addition to what I just mentioned now about the issues related to debt. So we can really see um, from the global perspective, we need really to do more in order to uh, um, uh, first to prevent the crisis, uh, that crisis, because that will make this gap even wider than what it is today. We have assets in the system. The global financial system have assets under management today, which exceed $110 uh, trillion um, uh, dollars based on um, um, some recent um, uh, updates uh, by PwC on that. But, um, and, and this is accumulated. And you can see the share of different regions of, um, of, of, of such assets. How much of that going to the um, um, SDGs investments, efforts, investment, human capital, infrastructure, and resilience is, is a, a fraction of that, is a fraction of that. Um, and what's left is basically what we see here uh, in, um, in, um, uh, in gaps. Of, uh, of funding. So uh, that um, gets me into the, um, the final um, uh, slide, which again, a reminder of the, uh, of the importance of discussing finance, including uh, debt management in the context of um, um, achieving the SDGs. Um, um, we are in the uh, at the, still at the beginning of the decade of action, the last 10 years before we um, reach the finish line in 2030, and we need to do uh, more um, in order to achieve the SDGs. Um, how to integrate sustainability in the global and country level financing. Um, um, how many countries today, a valid question, have an SDG based uh, budget? Um, uh, how the public sector and private sector can work better together in order to um, achieve the SDGs, what a, what what a, the scope and room for more effective partnerships between the public and the private sector and local communities. The second point is basically about uh, aligning the recovery efforts with targeted investments in social protection systems, uh, with efforts to secure just transition. Um, it, 
regardless our efforts today, because of the challenges we are facing, the climate um, challenge, the uh, issues with uh, vaccine and health, um, uh, the, uh, um, all of that require uh, investments in social protection um, and um, supporting uh, our, our systems um, um, uh, in, in the case of failure of uh, really achieving uh, the uh, uh, required targets. We need to have huge investments in the, safe, in the, uh, uh, in the safety net and, and in, in social protection. A third point is putting debt management and reform of the international debt architecture firmly back on the agenda. Um, um, and we hope in the remaining important meetings um, in, in this calendar year, including the meetings for uh, um, uh, the G20, before that the meetings during ANGA, the General Assembly of the UN, and after that the annual meetings of the fund and the bank that issues related to debt management and debt prevention that crisis prevention should be put again on, uh, on the priority list. Um, um, another area of work or a fourth area of work is the acceleration um, of the closing of the multifaceted digital divide and increasing investment in sustainable infrastructure. And um, a fifth point is combating illicit financial flows. You cannot do investment and you cannot do management while there is a major um, uh, leakage in the system through the illicit financial uh, flows. Um, happy to see some um, good agreement um, as announced by the G7. It's good to see some good agreement um, between the G7 and the G20 on issues related to taxes and tax evasion. But uh, this is just a welcome step. Efforts are needed to neutralize the ways in which it is highly skewed towards advanced economies, all of these measures to deal with tax evasion. And, and the final point is, bo is boosting the support required for countries in special situations who remain largely ex excluded from relief uh, initiatives, um, uh, including middle income um, uh, countries uh, that are uh, uh, suffering from variety of, uh, of vulnerabilities. Thank you so much. That was a very, um, a very uh, stimulating um, video. I'd like to now just hand over to Mahmoud. We're, we're running um, a little bit um, slow on time, uh, just for any, uh, any um, additional comments that you have, Mahmoud. And I think probably your presentation is also on your website, I suspect. So if people want to review it later, or we can put it on the, the wider conference website. So uh, do you have any additional comments, Mahmoud? No, no, th th thank you so much. And uh, so, sorry, I took uh, more than what I planned, uh, but um, let me just uh, uh, say something about how, again, to prevent a crisis, basically um, through ability to detect where the sources of such crisis uh, could be. And one of the things is basically a simple question. Where is the, the debt um, had gone uh, so far? Who is bearing the debts that have been issued? In the case of the emerging markets, more than 60% of the debt issued ended up with the local uh, banks. In the case of the advanced economies, more than 20% uh, with the central banks. Um, so here, the way to, to handle the, um, the, the debt uh, implications as far as where it is sitting now is basically going to be different from the advanced economies to uh, the emerging markets. Then the big issue of concern, which I mentioned, um, um, uh, I think, uh, repeatedly, but let me say again, because there are opportunities because of the ANGA in a few weeks, G20 meetings, annual meetings, the initiatives of the UN Secretary General are about short-term measures, mid-term measures, and long-term measures. The short-term measures, DSSI, unfortunately, um, uh, G20 announced that's not going to be extended. So it's not going to be very helpful, especially that we're seeing the same kind of trouble that we're in in developing economies are still with us uh, today. What's so called common framework is not that common. Um, it's only three countries that benefited from it uh, so far and uh, didn't really solve their problems to the three low-income uh, countries in Africa. It's not covering uh, the middle income countries and it's not covering as well the private sector creditors. And many of the, uh, the countries are reluctant to use the DSSI and, uh, and the common framework because of fear of downgrade 
by the rating agencies. So we need really here to be innovative, but technical solutions are there that will be needing the political leadership that should be demonstrated in the uh, upcoming meetings. And there are, of course, a link between all of that and climate uh, change as well. But I'm happy to come back to this issue because Glasgow is going to be the host of climate change. And there are many solutions related to the debt swaps um, and climate that I'm happy to tackle as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for a very stimulating intervention. And as I said, I think we can um, probably put the whole video up on the, um, the wider website for people to review um, later. Uh, and so now I'd like to talk, turn to um, uh, Maureen Ware for um, her um, presentation. So Tran, if we can bring Maureen up on screen. Thank you, Tony. I'll just pick up from where uh, the previous presenter stopped. I think he's given us a very nice um, coverage globally. So I, it makes sense for me to focus a bit on uh, the African debt situation. And I'll zero in with some examples from Kenya. So if you go to the next slide, please. So why are we concerned about the Sub-Saharan African public debt situation? I think the, the previous presenter has clearly uh, staged the stage by giving us what's happening globally. And uh, if you saw one of the charts, there is that uh, chart that's showing uh, debt having uh, uh, developed quite rapid, rapidly. And that happens to be most of the African, uh, Sub-Saharan African countries fall in that category. So what we can basically say is most Sub-Saharan African countries, as we speak, are grumbling with debt. More, we have seen more countries falling into either moderate, uh, they are at either at a moderate risk or high risk, or uh, have actually already fallen in debt stress. For example, Mozambique, Somalia, these economies are already in debt distress. Even for countries like my own, Kenya, which have, like a few years ago, classified under low risk of debt, are now under the high risk, are at high risk of debt. Small economies as well, not being spared, Uganda, Rwanda, a few years ago, they were classified as being in at low risk of debt. As we speak right now, they have now moved to moderate risk. And once the countries are at moderate risk, it means that there are high chances that they are going to move to the to high risk of, of, uh, of debt. So we have a situation where about we are talking about about 30, 30, 30 countries having either uh, uh, being at in one of these scenarios or either moderate high or in debt distress and this this is a situation that is really worrying and as uh, i think uh, mahmoud uh, presented or picked out we are not this that situation had already started uh, manifesting itself way before the pandemic so what we've seen right now is that if you look at most of the African countries, their to GDP ratios have actually aged up. For example, in my own country here in Kenya, we are now talking about a debt to GDP ratio of about 65%, way from below 50% just a few years ago. The other important point to note is the shift in the composition of the external debt. We have seen a a decline in multilateral debt on one hand and an increase in commercial debt. And this follows from uh, the fact that uh, there has been a, most of these countries had easy access to the capital markets as the interest rates, especially, and also their credit rating situations of these countries improved, especially after the financial crisis. Now, what has that got to what does that lead us to? Um, if you just go to the next slide. Okay, I had an example there. For example, in uh, Kenya, in 2020, the share of multilateral debt was about 66. That has declined to about 
31%. On the other hand, the, commercial, the share of commercial debt has increased from barely 4% in 2010 to about 31% in 2020. 2020. And this is a, a scenario that is witnessed across most of the economies. What are the implications of this? One of the implications of this is, of course, directly leads to increased cost of debt servicing. Now, since I'm not able to show my slides from this end, Trump, if I may ask you to just go to the second last slide, I just had like a simple uh, chart there just to show um, what this implication of interest payments really mean uh, using the example of Kenya. Go to the next slide, please. Next, next, the last one. Yeah, so just to illustrate this point, in the fiscal year 2020-2021, the external debt, this is the external debt uh, interest payment by lender category. And we can see from this slide that we can see that over 60% of interest payments are going to commercial lenders. And also, if you look at the total uh, interest payments to the external on external debt, 45% of that was on interest payments. So basically, this is part of the reason why most of this. Uh, countries have actually found themselves, in fact, sliding into debt distress or situations of moving from low to moderate or moderate to high, high uh, debt risk. Kindly, if you just go back, please. So the other implication of uh, the increased cost of debt servicing, it basically means that we have a limited space for limited fiscal space which has been worsened by the adverse economic impact of the pandemic. So we are seeing a situation where revenue, for, revenue has been falling or we have witnessed revenue shortfalls because remember that the impact of the pandemic and the lockdown measures had a drastic impact on the revenue, uh, domestic revenue collection since due to the slowdown of the economic activities. And we, on the one hand, we have this revenue shortfalls and on the other, we have seen elevated government expenditures, of course, to deal with the pandemic. Like, uh, I mean, there have there has been, there has had to be boost in terms of uh, 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 financial expenditure in terms of boosting the, the, the health sectors to cope with the pandemic. So with this limited physical space, it immediately, and of course, it, it implies that we have also limited space for provision of economic, financial stimulus, and social protection to cushion the vulnerable groups, including the poor. Now, if you look at, for example, the, the fiscal stimulus that has been put up by the developed countries like US or Italy, it's nothing, and you compare with the, the fiscal stimulus, measures that uh, at least the African countries have attempted to, to put in place, it is nothing comparable because there is, there is very limited flexibility to offer this kind of uh, economic uh, recovery stimulus, which is in their need given that these are the same economies where we do not have employment benefits, where most people have lost incomes due to pandemic, and where we are seeing a situation of approximately it's being estimated like over of something like 30, 30 million people falling into poverty. So if there are any uh, 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 part of the globe, uh, the world where such measures would drastically be needed, then it's this particular kind of economies. I think uh, Mohamed also has presented quite well that I don't need to deliver the fact that the achievement of sustainable development goals is at stake. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, and also I, I don't want to repeat the, what has already been said, the timely response that we saw at the international uh, level is commendable. But I think 
it, it is important to note the limitations of these measures. Of course, we do appreciate that these are short-term measures. But if we talk, for example, the DSSI, which is uh, ending in December 2021, it's only on temporary suspension. It's only a temporary suspension of debt service payments to official bilateral creditors, and that excludes private creditors. And the amounts involved are quite minimal. Now, how do we then, so, uh, for example, handle the issue of the rising debt service, for example, even to the commercial uh, lenders? The issue of SDR allocation, I think it has already been highlighted that the entire continent's allocation is just $27 billion. This is just 4.2% of the $650 billion, which is not even an eighth. And I think that this was the time if uh, IMF was to make history by allocating these extra SDR allocations using a different criteria rather than based on quotas. Desperate measures may require desperate uh, responses. I think sometimes you have to go out of the norm and do things differently, depending on the situation. Couldn't we then uh, consider things like, instead of using the quotas, instead of then uh, based it on other factors like need or most affected or most vulnerable, the vulnerability of these economies. So if 20, 27 billion is for the entire continent and one country, for example, has 29 billion, where does that leave the majority of the people who actually need most of this uh, help that would come from this uh, SDR allocations. Of course, there has been issue of, of voluntary reallocation from the wealthy countries, but I don't think that that is something that is gonna happen automatically. And God forbid, I hope we, we may see that even if that takes place, it may again introduce some kind of conditionalities while maybe perhaps the original allocation was conditional. These are free allocations which are not based on any conditionalities. Next slide, please. So Maureen, can we um, quickly conclude so I can... Yeah, so this, uh, this is actually like my last slide. Yeah. So what can be done? I think um, the, the debt situation, uh, in my view, needs a multi-probed approach to addressing the debt and debt sustainability challenges that we have witnessed. So there's more to be done. I think we need to be talking about an economic or debt relief package, which would in include things like debt structuring and actual debt relief, not just suspension. There's need for increased transparency, both on the data side, on the creditor side, uh, I mean, on the data side and also on the creditor side. There's also the need for prudent debt and economic management, particularly on the credit, uh, on the debt, uh, data uh, side, African countries, can do more with the resources that they have. I think we have seen, if you look at the reports of the auditor generals in most of these countries, you find a lot of uh, misallocation of resources, inefficiency, and some amounts not being known what, how, how they have been spent, issues of corruption. We can still do more with what is available. There's need for clear debt policy, including debt savings. Some of countries have this, but again, enforcement has been an issue diversification of debt sources. I think exposure to one dominant, uh, let's say, creditor has its own risk. Domestic resource mobilization, there's so much you can talk about this. Of course, when you talk about domestic resource mobilization, what comes to mind is tax, tax revenues. But I think uh, we countries need to be more innovative about this. Um, we have seen that sometimes, like uh, right now, countries are under pressure in increasing tax, tax, tax rates. But I think they need to be more innovative in terms of widening the tax base and also exploring the capital domestic markets, infrastructure bonds, countries like Kenya has issued infrastructure bonds which have proved to be quite su successful and raising domestic savings. We also need to look at uh, the role of FDI, trade opportunities, how can we make these countries increase their capacity to service debts by giving uh, increasing their export revenues and building back better. 
we have an opportunity to build back better by transforming the, the uh, doing, uh, undertaking some of the serious economic transformation, which requires rethinking uh, some of the development models and financing. And uh, I think uh, it's also good at this juncture to mention that whereas we talk about all this, I think we cannot like uh, isolate it with, from the role of access to vaccines in fast tracking, uh, fast tracking uh, economic recovery. And uh, unfortunately, again, we have seen uh, unequal access to vaccines. Most of the African countries' uh, population have, uh, countries have not even vaccinated. Even uh, maybe we are talking about less than five percent for those ones which have already uh, uh, made. Uh, which I have gone ahead to to to, to initiate this uh, this vaccination programs. Yeah, and uh, in, in in view of time, I stop there. Thank you very much for. So, so, so thank you very much, Maureen. Um, particularly the last point. You know, this is a pandemic, and we have to act with uh, great um, urgency for it. Um, so, if we could now um, bring up um, bring up David. Um, on the screen, David Mahali on screen, um, and unmute him. We will be running a, a little bit over time, folks, but I'm they're afraid this is the inevitable consequence of uh, using these technologies. So, David, the, uh, the floor is yours. You, we've had a very interesting uh, couple of presentations. What, what are you going to add here to the story? Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much. Um, I don't know if uh, Trump could handle my slide or unlock my access to slides because I don't have access to slides right now. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? All right, at least. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, and Trump, can okay. you unlock the slide, please. I don't have access to that button. It just stays red. I want to talk about three things. Uh, and because uh, my Mahmoud and Maureen have already touched on on so many issues, and uh, if if I get access, I still don't have access to to unlocking those slides. Okay, that's good. If you present them, that's even better. So the first thing I want to talk about is the DSSI, uh, which which uh, which both Maureen and Mahmoud touched on, and we did some particular research with uh, with, with Andrea Presbyterian Valetti Lang. That's the next on the next slide, and the bottom line from that dot, from that research is that the SSI works in the short term. So what our research finds, if you go to the next slide, is that the 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 borrowing rates of these countries, the sixteen countries in the DSSI that also have traded bonds, because many of these DSSI countries don't have bonds that are traded on open markets, but for those that have bonds on the market, we can see a drop. In, in, in the borrowing rates, about 200 basis points. So instead of borrowing at 10%, maybe they're borrowing at eight, uh, the, the rates on these bonds are like 8%, so that's 200 basis point drop for you. And um, I'm not gonna go into the methodological detail. It worked in the short run when we thought that maybe this is a very quick sudden stop, and then maybe you know countries can sort of escape COVID uh, with lockdowns and then other measures. In the long term, we this method that we applied wouldn't work. There have been so many things have happened, including defaults in Zambia, the common framework, all sorts of things. So it worked temporarily. I don't. I but the SSI is, was never designed. It's only postponing that. It was never designed to help in the long term. And this is an ongoing. It's a, it's going to be a it's a long road to get out of this pandemic. So that's on the SSI. The second point I wanted to share. Uh, I'm going to try to be quick again in the interest of time. That's on the second slide, I think one issue that's not been touched on is who the creditors are. So obviously there's the, the private sector uh, and, you know, and, but the, then there's the official creditors and the official creditors are the ones you would expect or you would hope can step in in times of crisis. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. And many, many people have written and discussed how China has become alongside the World Bank and some of the multilateral, the dominant multilateral. Uh, so, I've, uh, so, so China, which, which is shown in blue, is, is, the, is alongside the World Bank, the dominant creditor, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in many regions, it's, it's one, of the, one of the major ones uh, in terms of total debt stock. What people have been less focused about uh, and you can see on that on that slide actually that you know uh, 
No, anyways, so China is the office, uh, is, 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 it has been a, an increasingly important and now the dominant official bilateral creditor. Uh, but what has received less attention and something we written with Scott Morris uh, on is how for many, many years, China has been disbursing more and more debt. That's the red line. So new fresh loans to con developing countries every year growing, growing rapidly from bail, barely any debt disbursed in 2004 to massive disbursements of 20, 30 billion a year uh, in 2015, 2016, when it reached peak. And then it started declining. Again, that decline has been noted by some. Uh, they've... Uh, it has partly domestic reasons, things are happening about China repiverting towards its own domestic economy, partly also because they've been burned by some of their, there's been some debt problems. Djibouti was the first, Sri Lanka and some others. But the other thing that's, that, that you can see in, in, in the World Bank data, if you go very granular, is that the debt servicing costs have start, started increasing. Obviously, debt servicing comes with a lag, right? Chinese disburse loans, and it's only after some years, there's often like grace periods, that the disbursement comes. And what we note in our piece is how in 2019, for the first time ever, really, or first time in, the, in, in this new period, developing countries have serviced more debt than they have received in fresh ones to China. So China's net position, if you will, has, has changed. Many countries are now servicing more debt than they're receiving. Now, obviously, the SSI helps with that in the short term. For the, for the next two years, it's been postponed. But we're still in a new world compared to what was before, where countries were excited that there's this new lender in town, official lender in town, which provides loans at ra relatively cheaper credit than, say, bonds, like uh, compared to the private sector. But now, repayment starts. And that, that I think, this it talks a bit to this type of conflict we might expect between creditor and lender when we get into a repayment situation. And, uh, and the third point I wanted to talk about briefly uh, on slide three is collateralized lending, because I think that we're going to see more, you know, DSSI has sort of, and SDR allocations have helped in the short time. So maybe there's a more breathing space, but as we, you know, as we go into 2022, I expect there's going to be a lot more conflict uh, between between uh, official creditors and private creditors, uh, and and, there, and you know as, as countries really struggle to 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 get more financing because uh, uh, to fill their needs. And I think one aspect uh, that is going to be important is is collateralized loans. Already, we've seen that in many many uh, countries. This is, these are examples from Africa where, uh, where collateralized loans have, have, have uh, where either countries have gone very creative in trying to get new financing or where they reached conflict, uh, where there was a conflict because they had collateralized some of the lending with natural resources. So Ghana and DRC were two countries that very recently tried creative ideas to, to sell their future proceeds. Uh, and and what, one, one takeaway I wanted to share from our research with uh, Jijong Huang and Aisha Adam uh, on, on resource bank loans is how few lenders there are actually in the marketplace who are interested in, in providing collateralized loans. It's basically, I mean, there's, there's basically, it's basically China and oil traders. And if you look at the volumes in terms of the money, it's literally mostly Chinese uh, companies that offer such, so such collateralized loans. Uh, so, so that means that there's not really, really competition in, in terms of providing such credit. Uh, and yeah, and countries are, are, but countries are getting creative. They do wanna, they do wanna leverage financing in a difficult situation. So many of them turn to, to, uh, to the natural resource base, because especially because we are in a mineral boom, there is strong demand for minerals. And so, so I think that's, that's a space to watch. And in our report, we provide some recommendations on, on how to do this kind of borrowing better. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much uh, um, for, for being able to, sh to share my, my research and thoughts. So um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, David. Um, uh, as I said, we are running over time, but I'd just like to um, have a response for a, a couple of things that have come up in Q&A, uh, one of which, and, and anybody can reply to this across the panel, 
um, uh, can we trust the uh, sovereign credit ratings? Um, these seem to control the lives of debtors, you know, the Standard and Poor and Fitch ratings. Uh, can we um, can we trust that? And um, uh, a second issue that seems to be coming up in the chat is um, how much of the uh, borrowing that we're seeing can actually that be attributed to the response, the fiscal response to the pandemic? So how much of this borrowing that's going on actually is then flowing into a fiscal response, you know, healthcare and so forth in response to the pandemic. So does anybody on the on the panel want to take the question about do we trust the sovereign ratings and then move to the fiscal response question or you can do the fiscal response can question for yeah. A small one on the ratings, actually. On the DSSI, the rating agencies played a very particularly problematic role. At the beginning, the, uh, when the DSSI was announced, and actually you can see that in, in our own analysis, the, the rating agencies came out in rather uncertain words, but they kind of they, they implied that countries might get downgraded for participating in the DSSI. So many countries worried, including Kenya, actually. Uh, somebody more, more can share more on that about participating because it might create a stigma. Now, you know, our research strongly contradicts that. We saw no stigma effect. We saw rates going down. And we also saw rating agencies sort of back, walk back this kind of uh, downgrading. There has been no downgrade for DSSI participation. Whether there'll be some for uh, common framework, it's we're, we're yet to see how that plays out. But that's, that's what I can share on the rating agencies. And, and Maureen uh, Macbu, do you have any view on the on the ratings agencies or on the fiscal response question? Okay, maybe just to add what to David has said. Yeah, it's true that at the beginning, uh, countries were very skeptical about participating in the DSI, DSSI initiative because of uh, the downgrade. And I think it's good that uh, David's research shows that, uh, uh, thank God, there has not been no, no significant rise in the in the rates, but I think um, I think right now, as you clear, we clearly saw from David's uh, presentation, we need to wait and see what lies ahead. Because if DSSI is not going to be extended, then it simply means that uh, these countries will have no option but to find ways of repaying the the, the debt. And the question is whether, uh, let's say, by 2020 next year whether these countries will already be having the breathing space that was actually being created in the first place because the pandemic, remember, is not over and still with us. So the, the, the impact of the spending on the pandemic is still there. Uh, African countries still have to vaccinate uh, their population. There is, they, they, they still be need to more to spend on that. And so we, 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 hope, we can only hope that the situation uh, with the rating will not then uh, again maybe uh, uh, lead to down, down, downgrade of the ratings when these countries uh, find themselves or when the, the, the DSSI initiative is suspended altogether. In terms of how much, uh, okay, I, I thought I'd just chip in on the next question. I think that one, will, someone will have to go to the uh, actual data, but I know that, uh, uh, most of the the, 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 the the demand for 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 more debts, in, especially after the pandemic, has been triggered by the pressure to first of all again deal with the increase to to the to the to the elevated expenditure that is needed to deal with the pandemic. So we may not have the uh, like specific specifically the the numbers, but we know that uh, at least in the context of Kenya, part of that uh, funding has really been triggered by the fact that. The government has had to 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 increase the expenditure towards the fiscal response uh, needed to deal with the pandemic. Yes, yes. Okay. So th thank you very much, uh, Maureen. I'd like to just hang to uh, Mahmoud. I'm going to give you the last uh, word from the panel, Mahmoud. Your your response on debt rating agencies and fiscal response. Right. I'll be very brief. On on the issue of the rating agencies, the issue of trust, as far as the markets trust them. Um, uh, we need to trust them. Um, but um, uh, the matter is much more complicated than that, of course, because if the whole um, um, international monetary and financial architecture that's being challenged, as far as the existent pillars of the current international financial monetary architecture, 
the sovereign rating agencies are doing what they are being paid for or charging the issuers and the markets for as basically doing the kind of rating and we cannot tell them stop doing what you should be doing and tell the people that matters are under control while they are not or much better or worse than they are this doesn't mean that they are perfect we see them in uh, doing um, um, some uh, major mistakes in the past including the global financial crisis but now we cannot blame them for trying to do their job i think the the system needs to go beyond beyond them uh, including of course the the fears of the mdbs uh, to to lose the triple a rating and that's why they are not participating in the dssi so the, i think the discussion should go beyond the rating agencies into the global uh, governance, the global financial system and monetary system. This gets me into the, um, the and very quickly, to the fiscal um, uh, question. Um, I agree with Maureen. It's, it's a country-specific issue. And uh, the managing director of the IMF has an interesting say uh, when she found uh, countries borrowing, say, well, borrow and spend, but keep the receipts. So this is an issue of transparency. And, um, and you will be seeing that uh, some of the money is being spent on protected lives and livelihood, and some of the money had to be dealing with the problems that we tell um, we have been sharing. That many of the problems that we're seeing developing economies and emerging markets precede the, the COVID-19, including the imbalanced structures of their uh, budgets and the fact that they have been in problems of debt and they need fresh financing. So some of them are borrowing to repay old borrowing, which is not really. Uh, uh, to do directly with the COVID-19 impact on lives and livelihood, but basically of old structure problems that need to be uh, dealt with and challenged. But we need to go and see the receipts for accountability on country-specific basis, and the fiscal monitor and the fiscal tracker of the IMF could be providing some help on that. So thank you, Mahmoud. I think that's a, a very good uh, point to end on. So borrow, spend in response to the COVID crisis, and your SDG needs, but keep the receipts. So uh, I'd like to, at this point, uh, thank very much uh, our excellent uh, panel and give them a sort of virtual clap uh, and to thank you, the audience. Uh, we must now uh, end the debt session because there will be other uh, nice sessions starting soon. Indeed, there is a, a series of fireside chats going on, but this is a, a three-day conference and uh, I hope to see you all uh, later in the uh, the meeting. So thank you again for our excellent uh, team and um, greetings to all wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Bye-bye.